So the question on the nation's lips, really, is that applause that we heard from the, the caucus room on the evening Winston Peters announced the, the decision, mm. it was claimed that you'd been watching Family Feud. Is that true? <laughs> I can confirm that um, the team who, who did fall into applause who were in another room, they weren't in, I was in my office, right. and they were down the hall, were indeed watching Family Feud. Right. So I went to investigate <laughs> to discover that they... Because the theory was, in fact, I think it was put forward by Patrick Gower, that the applause obviously meant you had secret knowledge. Yes, that was the theory. <laughs> I can confirm it wasn't the true. secret knowledge was that there is apparently much hilarity in Family Feud. Exactly. Um, but no, I can, uh, that is, it, it was absolutely true. They were watching Family Feud. I found out, and Clark actually, for our own purposes, um, filmed that evening. Uh, and um, I think if anyone ever sees that footage, they'll know uh, that I learned about the outcome at exactly the same time as the rest of New Zealand. In hindsight, do you think that's the best way to announce that kind of decision? Is there any other way you can do it? Oh, look, I, I, I had no real expectation about how that might play out. Mm. I knew what had happened in 1996, so I knew that it was likely that we would learn in that way, mm. and so I was ready for that, so it didn't really surprise me. And I also know um, that it was a very difficult decision and that New Zealand First took a lot of time to consider it, and I think probably... That was the only yep. really way it could roll out. Mm. Were you mentally preparing for the other decision, like for disappointment? Y yes. I think I had, I think in some ways it would have been hard to fully mentally prepare you for, for either because there's such huge weight between, behind both decisions. Um, but to a certain degree, when you've been in opposition for nine years and when you've lost a few elections, probably what you're most prepared for is loss. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah, that's very honest of you. Yes. And now you're used to winning. Um, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call one time used to it. <laughs> um, Getting used to it. Yes, well, I've had, I've had that occasion now. Oh, but of course, the by-election was probably really my first win in, in, in politics, really. Looking back on that campaign, from the moment that Andrew Little stepped down and you took over the leadership, things changed dramatically for the party. But... It was the, still the same party, same policies really. Now I know you're going to be modest about this, but what made the difference? What's your secret sauce? You must have thought about it. We all watched it happen. You know, to be honest, I, ha I haven't thought about it. And I've, I've talked a little bit about even this period now, there's no time for reflection. You know, there's been no time to sit back and think about what happened in that campaign or even what's happened in the last two weeks because three years isn't a long time and I don't want to waste a moment um, uh, in an exercise that doesn't really get us any further now. I, I, probably Christmas time I'll sit and have a little think about mm. the last couple of months but for now there's just, I know it sounds trite, but there's just so much to do. No, I understand that but you yeah. wouldn't be having that much to do if you hadn't made the difference mm. and got Labour to the, the place in the polls that it was able to get to, I'm kind of fascinated. If you were looking at someone else who'd achieved that, you'd have to think there is a high level of, of emotion and something intangible that mm. goes on in terms of the way people vote and yeah. respond. I've certainly observed that in um, other, other countries' politics. I've observed that and yeah. I've viewed it with um, equal measure of interest and concern uh, I've always, you know, been of the view that, uh, yes, knowing who your leaders are and understanding their attributes and character traits uh, is, is incredibly important because there'll always be a time where they make a decision that they didn't campaign on and that you don't know their position on and you do want to have a sense of their values and what drives them, but that should never be at the expense of also understanding their policy platform. So, uh, yeah, yes, personality matters, but it is not everything, and it, I would be loath for that to be the case. If I'm right, you've never actually voted in anything other than an MMP that election. That is correct. I've always voted in the MMP elections. Do you think your generation, um, because of that kind of experience, just has a slightly subtler and better understanding of it? I'd like to think so, um, and this is probably... Um, 
this will probably be one of the most, you know, um, almost pure examples of an MMP government. We have, uh, we've formed a government um, using a coalition, but also a confidence and supply agreement. We have ministers from three parties. Um, you know, of course, there's a lot to prove. Yeah. But it's a robust system, and I've seen what it takes to make it work, uh, and I know that we've got the relationships to make it work too. Just generationally speaking, how do you and your generation describe yourselves? I think you're kind of on the cusp of millennial and X or somewhere yes, around yeah. there. Yeah, Te technically, yes. Yeah. Um, probably more on the X, but probably. Late Gen adjacent, X. Late Gen X, adjacent to the millennials. Right. Um, technically speaking. Um, do you put much store in those kind of labels? Does it, do you feel like. I do think there are generational differences. You know, there's a, there's a lot of negativity that hangs off them. Mm. Um, you know, even baby boomers carry a lot of um, unf unfair flack, I think. So, look, th there's, every generation has, has a label that probably carries some negative connotations. But I do think there are generational differences. You know, the, the kids who grew up in the 90s um, grew up understanding and being climatised to notions of user pay, and it probably has shaped the way that they view the world and view politics and view their expectation of their government and society. Um, millennials have grown up in a, a relentless um, bombarding of information. Um, you know, f I just think that the, the almost, I'd describe them as being in an almost overwhelming environment and we have these expectations of them to be able to filter through everything that surrounds them and manoeuvre through in a way that we just didn't Mm. have to with past. So I, yeah, I think there are big generational differences and big challenges for each. When you talk about kids growing up in the 90s, that's you. That is me. Yeah, I mean you would have been a young child in the 80s. I was. But yeah. really we come of age in our sort of second decade, yes. don't we? Yes. What are, your, um, what are your memories of that, of that time? Culturally speaking, you know, who were, who were your cultural touchstones musically? Smashing Pumpkins. Okay. <laughs> now we um, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Smashing Pumpkins, um, Porter said, you know, Nirvana, Metallica. Keeping in mind, of course, I was I was raised in Morrinsville, so I had a mm. bit of an alternative um, um, bent. Um, Alice in Chains, um, and then over. Did you have a little goth phase? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Well, we, my friends did. I probably didn't strictly fall into that. And then over here, were all my friends listening to Pantera and Sepultura and Metallica. <laughs> And then over here was, you know, being culturally Mormon, Casey and Jojo and Boys to Men. So in a very eclectic world. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that, you know, um, because it, it's always meant that I think it's built a level of empathy. When I say empathy, not just for people in hardship, but empathy for people's perspective, you know, be it rural or urban, be it alternative or... Bogan, mm. you know, it just... I think I can yeah. categorically say you're the first New Zealand Prime Minister to even know who Pantera is. <laughs> 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 well, what about your political awakenings? Because, you know, you were describing what life for kids in the 90s was. Your, yep. your post-market. Yep. You have no real memory of living under a pre rogenomics um, economic system. Not pre, but I do remember... I do remember the effects of Rogenomics. Not in the yeah. kind of, not in the way that you As a you spectator, can, as a child. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Total, yeah. total observer. Um, but I have very stark memories from that. I know that surprises hmm. my parents, but I think when you're in a, when you're that age where, you know, you're starting school, there are certain things that feel very acute to you. Um, and by, by no means did I translate that into, you know, an, a political awakening. Uh, I just think that that was the moment that I noticed differences and felt something over there, like quite acutely. Right. Yeah, there's certain images I just remember walking home from school and seeing um, particular, you know, this uh, a young boy my age, so it would have been about five, walking on his own, clearly unwell, no shoes, sobbing, and just not understanding why someone would be in that situation when when I wasn't. So yeah, I think those are the kind of bits of that period that I remember. Because you could grow up at, at your age simply, you know, eating and drinking market orthodoxies <laughs> as just the only 
the only norm. So I'm wondering what, what, where your political instincts come from um, at a generational level. I wouldn't. Call, I wouldn't initially. I wouldn't call them political instincts. I would just call them a real social awareness. And so, even though I wouldn't call my immediate family um, overtly political when I was growing up, they were very socially minded. So my mum was always looking out for ways to help other people in the community. She was just that kind of person. My dad was a community-based police officer. Nothing was ever black and white, you know. Um, so that probably came first. Then when I started becoming the angsty teen who wanted to change the world, I just remember seeing po politics as an avenue for that. Um, and it was my um, auntie at that point who saw that in me and, and um, connected me to the Labour Party. So did you stand out at that age as, as yes. being you know, politically yes. motivated? Yes. Did you feel like a freak? Um, well, I was already Mormon. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think the two necessarily go hand When in you hand. live in Morrinsville and no one else, no one knows any others. So I was, I was, I was, a, I was a, a Mormon who um, openly affiliated with the Labour Party. <laughs> um, and I was a teenager. And so all of those things together. Um, my what a friends, mixed up kid you yeah, were. <laughs> it was, I was other. Um, but my friends were always fantastic about it, probably because I was their sober driver. But they also, <laughs> by default, just identified me as the political kid. Um, they, always, they always saw me in that way. So. Right. And that was fine. It was part of my identity. It was who I was. So. See, I never got the feeling, and this is not even a criticism of them, that, say, John Key or, or Bill English um, knew people who rented or mm. drove second-hand cars. Mm. Um, do you think you being your age might connect you a little more to another side of life? Well, I would, I would like to think so. Um, I mean, yeah, of course, you know, a huge number of my friends, most of my friends rent, the ones that don't don't live in Auckland, by and large. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I also, you know, try and keep a pretty close connection with my wider family, and they're always going to keep me grounded. Um, I think it's incredibly important that when you're in roles like these, uh, that you continue to be grounded, that you be accessible, um, and that you're always open to hearing the the other side of life. You mentioned Auckland then. You're not the first Prime Minister mm. from Auckland. No. But you know, looking well, I'm not at from Auckland. No, I know, but <laughs> I think I've lived here since 2009. Maybe that'll be the thing that makes the difference because I've always despaired, you know, that while we've had a lot of politicians from Auckland, obviously, and Prime Ministers, the relationship between Wellington and Auckland at a, at a funding and, a, mm. and an infrastructural planning level yep. has been extremely vexed, yes. to put it. Do you feel like you might bring an Auckland sensibility to the role? Oh, well, what I hope to bring is an understanding of the problems and opportunities. You know, this is my home. I love living in Auckland. Um, I also, having grown up outside of Auckland, know um, that there is a sensitivity around making sure that we don't neglect other parts of the country. So for me it will always be around making sure Auckland thrives, but that never being at the expense of anywhere else, and nor should it be, and nor does it have to be, but uh, the, yeah, that's something that, that always has to be really carefully managed. At the same time, I met with Phil Goff yesterday, and we sat down and had a conversation about the fact that we, both of us, list the same top priorities. Mm. Um, affordable housing, people having a roof over their head, being able to move around their city mm. and having clean water. You know, and so even just having those as shared priorities takes us a long way. I was going to observe that you know, some of your cornerstone policies, if you say housing, health, immigration, um, they so are... I wouldn't call that a cornerstone. Okay, well. Uh, <laughs> policy people are talking about. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. But anyway, Mostly what I, more journalists than people, I have to say. But anyway. Very, they're concentrated in this city. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, they're, yeah. There's, you know, you can see emblematic representations yeah. of all of those issues. Yeah. I'd put it to you, if you can't get Auckland right, you can't get New Zealand right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would, I would agree with that, although the challenges that we face more broadly are in some ways distinct. Um, you know, when I look at Auckland and I look at um, say, Gisborne, 
you know, the challenge we have in Gisborne is people just having opportunities, mm. you know, decent jobs with decent wages, a house that's not necessarily a house to be built, but a house that's dry mm. um, and um, uh, is, is quality. So there are some distinct issues, but I absolutely agree when you're talking about, um, you know, the biggest contributor um, as a city to GDP um, and, you know, productivity and everything up, Auckland matters, mm. Auckland matters. Um, what kind of Auckland would you like to, to see in sort of 10 or 20 years? I think if I was going to capture it, you know, just in a sentiment, I want people to feel proud of their city. I want New Zealanders to feel proud of this city as well. And what does that mean? Well, actually, just, um, just some of the basic things that you, when you travel to other cities, you have an expectation around um, decent public transport, you know, massive missing piece of our puzzle mm. uh, and that will solve so many of our other productivity problems uh, at its most basic just being able to get a sparky <laughs> who's willing to travel to your home without having to give up half a day's labouring just because they're in a, a car or a van um, so transport matters but actually I want people to walk around these streets and not see homelessness because you know, I remember coming back from New York living in New York and reflecting on how lucky we were as a nation not to have the homelessness that I saw in the soup kitchen I worked mm. in in Brooklyn and coming back and just noticing this massive escalation. So I have a hope that we'll be a city that we can feel proud of because we're world class in our facilities but we're world class in our, in our treatment of people as well. One final question I'm going to pick up off, off there. When we spoke during the by-election campaign you said that you'd like to be remembered if for anything at all, being kind. Being kind. Yes. And you've also said that you'd like this government to be perceived as being a kinder government. Yes. That's noble. I worry about you because politics is a brutalising business and I, you know how kind the next three years or six or nine will be to you. Do you have a coping strategy? How do you guard yeah. against it? Oh, and look, uh, what I'm you know, really firm on is you can be empathetic and have steel. And I think that's probably, um, that's probably the combination required for government. In fact, you want your empathy to have a bit of steel behind it because sometimes you're going to come up against some real de detractors from what you're trying to achieve. But as long as you always feel confident that you're doing the right thing, you know, I feel you'd be surprised what can carry you through. So that's a big part of what gives me my foundation. Um, but otherwise, you know, basic things like actually, I don't spend a lot of time on social media. I post and I engage as much as I can, but I don't spend a lot of time getting too drawn into the super personal stuff because it can really weigh you down. Um, and so just giving yourself a little bit of mental space to rise above and focus on the big stuff. Um, and that's hopefully a lesson that I'll take well beyond politics. Mm -hmm.